Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to COVID-19, The Humanities Respond. I'm Tyrus Miller, Dean of the UCI School of Humanities, and I'm pleased to be joined by Brian Donaldson, Sri Parshvanath Presidential Chair in Jain Studies in our Department of Classics and Philosophy. Welcome, Brian. Hi, Tyrus, and hi, everyone. Thanks for having me to talk about this uh, really important issue that we're all involved in. So I wanted to start just by referencing something related um, that, and, and I know that, you know, one of the things that we want to talk about is really how much in the news the question of animal agriculture has been, concerns about the vulnerability of the food supply, and also, you know, some really dramatic events in terms of the euthanasia of um, feed animals and uh, the, um, you know, the danger of COVID-19 infection for meat packers, and there's just lots of related topics to this. Um, I wanted to start actually a little bit with the news coverage, and, um, you know, I don't know uh, what's, what specific articles, you know, you may have been reading during this time, but just in my own, you know, fairly casual reading, not really looking for this topic in particular, um, I found a, an article in The Guardian by Jean Bauer that's called It's Time to Dismantle Factory Farms and Get Used to Eating Less Meat. That was in mid-May. Um, and then in the New York Review of Books, a piece of fairly extensive and, and detailed piece by Michael Pollan, who obviously has written a lot on, on food, um, entitled The Sickness in Our Food Supply, which is really a kind of rather extensive indictment of um, the concentration of the of the meatpacking industry and the effects that it has both socially and on our health. So that's really just a, kind of setting out a little bit of a context for people. That was that was a very recent article, uh, the June eleventh issue of the New York Review of Books. So I'm wondering if you could give us a, a brief overview of how meatpacking and animal agriculture more generally are being covered in the, in the pandemic. What are you seeing in the press and what are some of the main lines of uh, arguments and discussion that you're, you're, you're reading about? Yeah, I think you've raised two uh, important examples and it's also important to see that those two come from different angles. Uh, Jean Bauer, for example, is the longtime uh, CEO and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary, which is the largest farm sanctuary in the US with uh, I think three locations now, two in California and one in New York. And so his interest is really having worked um, in the farmed animal uh, protection movement for the last uh, three decades. And of course, Michael Pollan is usually more interested in the anthropology of food and food safety and public health. I think a few other areas that we see news coverage in is uh, first, just the basic recognition that COVID-19 was transmitted through animals that were trapped, killed, uh, to be used for food, uh, starting in China's markets. I think most recently there's been coverage that it's traced to a uh, kind of scaly anteater called a pangolin that is um, uh, killed and used for food in China. And we can talk more about uh, similar parallels that we have in our own food system. I think another big source of coverage that we've seen is how uh, the different COVID-19 outbreaks in U.S. slaughterhouses as well as around the globe. And that's brought some attention to just the close quarters that uh, workers function in within slaughterhouses, but also living conditions, how they often uh, will, uh, some of them will live in larger family units or with other co-workers. And that when workers get sick, that that slows down the machinery of industrial food production and we saw several slaughterhouses close and we saw the president deem them essential businesses so that they should reopen some had to reclose again and we're now just still kind of in the tail end of this and then finally as you already mentioned when a slaughterhouse slows down or closes the system of industrial food production uh, with animals is not at all designed for this kind of uh, interruption and so uh, there really is not a lot of give in terms of time, both because the ways that animals have been genetically modified to grow, there is a sweet spot, I guess you would say, in which animals have to get to the slaughterhouse because many slaughterhouses have been calibrated 
to take animals at just a particular weight range. And so this is why we have uh, now seen the US Veterinary Service deployed to help farmers really engage in some pretty uh, grotesque means of having to what they call depopulate their herds and flocks, such as using foam-based um, materials for suffocation or incineration, lethal injection, shotgun, closing off the ventilators. It really should uh, put to mind the kind of scale and numbers that we're dealing with when we talk about industrial animal meat production. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's something that I was really, I have to say, shocked by. Um, you know, obviously, I am aware of this, but um, somehow it brought it home that what you're saying about the animals having to be a particular weight. And that's really because they are already produced, even in their sort of living state, to fit into this industrial machinery of, of, of slaughter. And um, it's like a kind of, component that doesn't fit if it's the wrong the wrong weight or the, the the wrong size and that was that was for me i have to say you know one of the more shocking elements you know that was really brought brought out by by the reading that i i've been doing yeah but most people already realize that uh they realize it in some way that contemporary uh, industrial meat production is much more akin to putting together an automobile on the assembly line than it is to any romanticized ideas we have about old McDonald and overalls with red barns. And so I think your analogy is really apt and perhaps articles like this help to give a more visual or visceral understanding of what that metaphor means when we're talking about living bodies. So you've spent years researching um, in a Midwest pork slaughterhouse town, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit about your experience and what you learned from that, that study. Yeah, well, I was raised in uh, rural areas anyway, in Indiana and Michigan, so I already had, it was really that experience that moved me toward farmed animal advocacy in the first place, just to see and learn, especially as um, factory farming and industrial farming was really taking hold to see how it changed the landscape of these rural communities. But when I got my first uh, visiting assistant professor teaching position, it was in a uh, very small rural town in Illinois. And uh, there were uh, three businesses there, the college, a pet food manufacturer, and a pork slaughterhouse. There's about 9,000 people who lived in that town. And when I got that job, I really thought that the only way I could uh, thrive or really accept it and move forward would be to just try to learn everything I could possibly understand about uh, the machine of the slaughterhouse, both inside and all of the moving parts that uh, keep it moving day after day. And so I think it really was an invaluable time to get a, a much closer behind the scenes look. And I, I think maybe the biggest takeaway is that there are so many misconceptions about what we would call America's heartland or the heartland of food production, especially citizens who live on the coasts or who are living in cities away from these areas. I think there's a tendency to see them as uh, racially homogenous and somewhat politically provincial. And at least in slaughterhouse towns and regions, it hardly could be farther from the truth. They are extremely internationally diverse. They are very uh, strong in their technolo uh, technological innovation. And uh, they are playing really important roles in global policy and uh, national policy. So just to, maybe I could give a few examples. Would that be helpful? Yeah, please. Um, so I think, first off, just to think about America's heartland in general, um, is this idea of, uh, it's, it's much more cosmopolitan than most people expect. In the town that I lived in, at the slaughterhouse, most of the 1,500 employees were either immigrants or refugees. And it's interesting to learn that the various organizations, such as Department of Homeland Security, that work with um, often religious refugee resettlement agencies to funnel refugees to areas where there are, is slaughterhouse work. Uh, some of those employees uh, already have college degrees, uh, not all of them, 
but it's an accessible job with a median wage and uh, it will accept anyone even if they don't speak English. And in the slaughterhouse in Monmouth, uh, the town in Illinois where I worked, uh, there were 14 languages spoken there. And you can imagine how this changes the character of an entire small town and all of the surrounding regions that have their own slaughterhouses. I spent a lot of time in the schools where they were having to completely shift their approach to education to accommodate uh, limited English proficiency learners. You can imagine how that might impact civic services like police and fire that are now dependent on translation services, the uh, distribution of health care and how that's delivered to people when there's language barriers, and even the very uh, features of the town itself, where you would think about America's heartland, you probably wouldn't expect um, to have an African and Asian grocery store on the town square. And so I think that's one uh, sort of more personal element. And uh, there's, of course, a lot of richness that can come with that in these uh, small towns and communities. But another aspect that people are really unfamiliar with is that when we think of America's, America's heartland, we think that this is the, the stable and secure place of American farming. And actually, we find that many of these areas are increasingly foreign owned. So the slaughterhouse in Monmouth, which started in the 1940s, was a, eventually purchased by Smithfield. But Smithfield, who was the largest pork producer in the world, was purchased by a Chinese firm in 2013 in the largest takeover ever of a US company on record. Um, in that region, also the local granary, this is where farmers bring their grains to be stored or distributed globally, it had been owned by a local company or a local family for about 80 years, now owned by a Japanese firm. And so we have to ask why is it that? other countries want to own these means of production. And this is something uh, both in terms of land and these uh, industrial elements that are increasingly foreign owned, which brings us to another really critical part of understanding contemporary meat, which is technology and grain farming. Um, I had the really uh, unique opportunities to spend quite a lot of time with farmers who grow grain and soy and if you've ever gone through any Midwest area, you probably have seen these flowing fields of, of green. And um, we really cannot understand the food system today without understanding how the US government has set up a food structure funded by taxpayers to subsidize grains like corn, soy, and barley that are primarily fed to livestock. And so because it's incentivized, because it's also insured at a higher level, it really changes the uh, state of farming in these communities where in order to insure oneself and to help hopefully turn a profit, farmers have to have more and more land, which means there are fewer and fewer of them. And they have to have very tech forward equipment. So I have written in GPS um, guided combines, and uh, ridden with farmers who are both planting and harvesting with equipment that I had no idea existed. And there is really way too much risk for these farmers to grow anything but corn, soy, and similar monocrops, the majority of which, and when I say majority, I mean about 80% of soy um, and, and even higher than that of corn, which goes to feed livestock. Um, this has been an issue for quite a long time because as farmers have been incentivized to do this, the US has had a glut of products like corn and soy. And so if we think of the ethanol industry, which is a corn-based fuel, that, was a, that really emerged out of farmers needing some place to take this excess corn. And we can think in economics, there's a, a principle called Say's Law, which is that demand creates a supply. And in terms of meat production, you have to have bodies and mouths to eat this grain, which is so cheap. And it's partly because the grain and soy, uh, corn and soy is so cheap that other countries want to get access to the means of production because it's simply cheaper to go through US uh, producers for both grain, soy, and livestock. Because if we think about your analogy for the auto uh, assembly line, if you had a car and most of the parts, or at least the most essential parts, could be provided free or low cost, you'd be able to sell that car a lot cheap, uh, more cheaply 
And that's really the state of our food system. It is so tilted toward incentivizing feeding these grains to living beings uh, in a very inefficient way. And then it makes it very cheap. So it doesn't really make sense, but it's cheaper to go to a store or to a McDonald's to buy a burger than it is to buy a small container of mushrooms. And that's uh, not by accident, that's by design of current US policy that really has to change. And you see that very clearly uh, in that juncture of technology and uh, the, the supply chain that keeps the machinery of uh, US slaughterhouses, uh, not just moving, but growing. Right. I want to just pick up on your, your evocation of, you know, a process of globalization and corporatization that really, you know, um, belies that image of sort of the small autonomous, you know, individualistic, um, you know, agricultural uh, producer that I think is increasingly, I mean, it's a reality for a very small number of people, but increasingly a kind of mythology that gets drawn on. Um, and you mentioned the, the, the grain supply. Of course, you know, many of those farmers aren't even in some way owners of the seed, but they're licensing, you know, a seed strain um, that's coming from your Monsantos and, and other large um, agribusiness uh, corpor global corporations. Um, it, your head starts to spin a bit when you kind of really understand the interconnectedness of these, these food systems. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I another element that a lot of um, you know people probably don't realize about farmers is that uh, to be a U.S. farmer today, because they're increasingly large, uh, it can be very lucrative, but it comes with a great deal of risk. Most farmers they function on constant debt, and uh, it's part of what you're referring to here, which is one way of thinking about it is vertical integration, which is that in the same way that we have the big four automakers. We have some big uh, players that basically, such as Tyson, Cargill, Smithfield, that have tried to uh, really get control of all the means of production. And that means uh, from creating facilities in which um, animals are bred and having that separate, and then having those delivered to farmers. Now, some of those farmers uh, remain independent, but many of them, as you referenced are contract farmers and that can be both true on the grain side as well as the uh, animal housing side and so some farmers provide work and labor other farmers just provide uh, the actual space and everything within it is managed by the vertical integration company and then they're shipped to slaughterhouses that are also owned by that company and so uh, you can see, uh, for example, I did an interview with a local farmer back in Monmouth just a few weeks ago during all of this. She's uh, one of the few uh, independent farmers that are left in that region. And because she is not a contract farmer, uh, she, they, all of their loads got pushed to the back of the line because, of course, if you have a vertical integration system, all of the contract farmers for that particular corporation are going to have priority access. And so it even puts more pressure on independent farmers to uh, become contract workers and to further narrow uh, the, the very few corporate uh, global players in the area of food production with meat. So to come back to our questions about the media, um, you know, from your personal experience and also from the deep study that you've, you've done of these questions, um, what do you think isn't being told us by the media about the food industry, about the, the meat industry? Are there things that we should be discussing about animal agriculture that really isn't part of the public discourse? There are so many things, I think, but let's try to focus on, a, I'll try to focus on a few of them. And I think first, it's just really important to state very clearly that the current level of meat consumption and production is not at all essential as it's been presented, and nor is it inevitable, but it is really the outcome of policies that incentivize the production of cheap meat through the subsidization of monocrops. And then it's also paired 
with something that you and probably many listeners have heard, which is a repeated and unfounded call that we have to double uh, global meat production by 2050 for a global growing population. And so I want to look at both of those elements, um, both what we'll call meatification. Uh, that's a term I get from uh, Tony Weiss's book, The Ecological Footprint, which is uh, the explosion of monocrops now dotted with these islands of confined animal feeding operations. And that meatification is very different from evolutionary meat eating, right? It's an explosion of cheap meat that is then ingested to all kinds of ecological and human health costs. And on the flip side, we have this doubling narrative. So on one hand, we want to look at um, consumption itself. And we see that meat consumption globally is very uneven. On one side, we have uh, the US and Australia, about uh, over 250 pounds per person uh, annually consumed to other countries like uh, within Africa, India, uh, Indonesia, where we have less than 10 pounds per person, and then everything in between. And so we can see that people across the globe can survive and even thrive with um, a much lower amount of meat consumed. But it's important to see that there is that wide uh, range of consumption and to see it's often in industrialized countries where we'll have higher consumption. When we get this doubling narrative, and this narrative comes from meat producers, grain producers, uh, we hear it on the floor of the UN that we must double meat production. A simple math equation says that if the population today will rise from the current seven and a half billion to maybe 10, that is in no way a doubling of the population. So there's an implicit assumption that it's not just that we have to double the meat, it's that the citizens will be uh, engaging in a diet characterized by meatification. There is a sense that countries such as China and Brazil are going to massively increase their industrial meat production and consumption uh, using all of the tools of meatification that are currently present in uh, industrialized countries. And so these two elements of uh, the mechanisms of meatification, along with this doubling narrative. You know, this is something that's very hard to see. Many people don't question it because it comes from so many different sources. But it's one that I think has to really be examined and uh, boldly re rejected. Because meatification and its various effects are crushingly dangerous. Uh, they're dangerous to animals. Um, for example, most people would be very surprised to learn that there are no federal laws on the book to, books to uh, protect farmed animals from abuse. Most of the standard practices that are today commonplace in factory farms, such as removing uh, beaks, uh, cutting off tails, castrating, all without anesthesia, these would be considered felonies if done to dogs and cats. Uh, the only laws that are available for farmed animals are how they can be slaughtered. And oftentimes those exclude uh, fish and chickens, which make up uh, the major majority of all factory farmed animals. Also, COVID has really shown us this crushing timetable of the breeding, birth, life, and death of farmed animals. So a pig that could uh, live uh, perhaps 15 years is, will be killed at six months when they reach uh, 260 pounds. Uh, Chickens that can live for seven to 10 years are killed at six weeks. Cows that can live for 20 years are killed at uh, 18 months or for dairy cows four years after uh, a life of uh, repeated uh, breeding and production. And it's important to think that in the US, nine billion animals are killed annually. That's 30 times the US population. It's basically like slaughtering the whole US population, rebreeding it, killing it again 30 times over. It's a really staggering number, and it's very hard to get one's head around. Meatification is extremely dangerous for workers, and we're already seeing some of that through this news. Uh, it's been well documented for many years that it is uh, slaughterhouse work is uh, one of the dangerous occupations to hold. Uh, workers suffer injuries at three times the rate of the average American worker. And a recent study by the uh, journal, 
uh, Bureau of Investigative Journalism, rather, uh, showed that basically every other day, a slaughterhouse worker is in a long-term hospital stay, either for an amputation, a fracture, a burn, or a severe head injury. And so it's this extremely dangerous work, not just physically, uh, but also mentally. And it's been really interesting through this COVID uh, time to see that uh, Iowa lawmakers actually called on Congress to pass a law, not just to help farmers with the actual uh, depopulation of their animals, but also for mental health services. And there were many articles where farmers or their representatives were talking about how emotionally uh, and mentally devastating this was. But we have uh, tens of thousands of workers who are killing 9 billion animals a year, a year without really any thought to their mental health. So there is a question if, if this is so uh, mentally damaging to farmers, why should we be having anyone do it? Uh, and one really critical element with workers that I think have been overlooked and uh, really has to be put into the center of conversations around food is that in late 2019 and, and right as COVID has begun to move into the headlines, both Canada and the United States have lifted any limits on their slaughter line speeds. And as we're talking about workers being exposed to a pandemic virus, um, basically what this means is that the previous limits that were in place, uh, previously it was 145 chickens per minute that could be killed. That was the cap of US slaughter. Now it's been raised to 175. Uh, there was an, about 1,100 per hour cap of killing uh, pigs in the U.S. And now the cap has been totally lifted. There is no new limit at all. And part and parcel with lifting that law was the dialing back of a lower percentage of USDA workers in these facilities to uh, do inspections. Uh, some of, uh, I think it's about a 30% dial back of USDA inspectors with those roles now being replaced with company employees. Uh, this has been soundly uh, denounced by uh, unions where they still exist for workers, uh, by human rights advocates, by animal advocates, and even some USDA inspectors have uh, gone in these facilities and said that the environmental conditions are uh, much worse, that the risk of injury and animal abuse is all on the rise. And so even as we're talking about raising awareness about workers on the line, uh, we have a, a federal move that has lifted the speed entirely. So, I mean, these, are, these things are definitely not spoken about. Um, and I also could just say a few other things about uh, ecology and consumers, if you'd like, or you can jump in now. Yeah, let's, I mean, let's briefly talk about the uh, climate, uh, you know, the climate impacts. You know, we, we, we know the you know, some of the key areas of water use, of gas emission from, from animals, um, obviously the impacts of monoculture of, of grains for, for feeds. What do you see as the biggest climate issues that are associated with, with meat production? Well, you've named the basics. And, uh, you know, in general, uh, most people are aware that there is a close connection between ecology uh, environmental health and uh, meat production. But there still seems to be a gap in how to interrupt a system when it is putting such a stress on uh, the environment and contributing to climate. Um, I do think that there is some space here just to reiterate some basics, which is that, you know, a kilogram of animal flesh takes about a hundred times more water than a grain of protein. Uh, there's a recent study out by Cornell that says if we were to take all of the uh, corn, soy, and monocrops that we're feeding to livestock, uh, we could feed 800 million people. And of course, we could also just produce, use a lot less land um, if we were uh, going to be really thinking seriously about food security and uh, sustainability. But I think importantly, there is a really important study. It was put out in 2009 by World Watch, and it's still not been unrefuted. Um, by looking at the actual effects of climate and that most studies have only uh, looked at uh, what comes out of uh, 
kind of the backside of animals, right? That we, when we think about greenhouse gas emissions, most of those calculations are always only looking at, at part of it. And so this particular World Watch study also looked at uh, the inspiration and expiration just of breathing and uh, found that livestock is actually the single greatest contributor to climate change. And so even if we were to make modest adjustments in terms of industrial production, um, most of the uh, goals that have been set global climate agreements could be met through making changes in food production. And so I think it's really critical to see on how many levels uh, this is, has the impact. And, um, you know, not least of which what we're seeing now, which is on human health, because of course, you know, it would be different if, uh, you know, we had a, a population that was extremely uh, healthy in every way but we you know in addition to knowing that diets that are rich in uh, meat milk and eggs produce uh, contribute at least to uh, chronic diseases like certain cancers heart disease uh, diabetes uh, we can see such as with COVID-19 a very close link between uh, global health and animals that are either caught or raised for food if we just think back over the, the history of uh, epidemics, we can think of that um, MERS or Middle Eastern Re Respiratory Syndrome came uh, from uh, camels that were being used as food. Uh, SARS, which uh, came from a particular kind of nocturnal animal, animal called the civet. Uh, African swine flu, which is actually currently going on right now. There have been over um, six million animals that are culled and that's been going on during the whole time of COVID, is uh, coming from pigs, of course, uh, bird flu. There are over three dozen different strains of bird flu uh, that have uh, come from ducks, turkeys, and chickens, uh, foot and mouth disease in cattle and pigs. Uh, we have mad cow disease, which comes from feeding uh, rendered animal matter, uh, the brains of cows to other cows, uh, sort of a kind of a, a double uh, step back just to consider that on the different levels. And then we also have just day-to-day -day, uh, issues of infections like E. coli and salmonella that come from what do we do with all of this waste that these animals produce? I mean, for example, in Monmouth where I worked, you have uh, 10 to 12,000 pigs that were killed every day. That's more than the entire population of the city. And so the slaughterhouse had its own waste um, production system to process that, in addition to the city's own waste production system. What do we do with 30 times the U.S. population's waste? And so it is very uh, common that we hear these cases of the salmonella and E. coli uh, that are emerging, and uh, not least of which, of course, is also antibiotic resistance, that about 50% of all global antibiotics are um, given to livestock, and of course, germs become inured to that. And then when humans come in contact with those bacteria, we find that we are less and less able to utilize existing antibiotics to treat them. So on so many levels, we see that meatification poses tremendous danger, really across the board, ecologically, to animals, workers, and for public health. Well, um, you have raised our awareness about, and you know, a, a, a multifaceted picture of, um, of meat consumption and um, the impacts on, you know, on, on our society, on our individual health, on our, on our environment. Um, if you had to kind of take a, have a couple of takeaways for someone who may still be a meat consumer um, or a policymaker who is in some ways trying to make reasonable policy for a population that will probably continue to um, consume meat um, in the future, what would you want them to take away in this moment in history where these issues have been raised so starkly? I think first and foremost, it's to realize that typically policy follows public opinion. And so it is really important here to realize that individual consumers 
especially when they can join together, do have a lot of power. And we're seeing a lot of pressure put on industrial meat production in this way. And, um, and policy will follow public sentiment. Um, along with that, I think it's very critical to recognize that the food system that we have, it did not fall from on high. It was created and it can be created differently. You know, and when we think about just in the moment that we're speaking as protesters are out on the street, there has to be an imagination for something different. And that's how anything becomes different. And there's nothing that is inevitable about our current food system. It can change. And so it's really important to realize that connection between uh, individual consumers understanding uh, some of the behind the scenes elements. And COVID, I think, has given a window both to look into it and it's done almost the impossible, which is to slow down uh, the system itself. There is hardly anything that can interrupt the mechanism of industrial slaughter. So we're at a really critical point. I think uh, just practically, uh, there has to be a really uh, clear rejection of any of these doubling narratives that, that come around that when we hear them. Um, just to recognize that um, the assumption that meatification will become the global norm or that there has to be this industrial explosion of meat consumption globally is not inevitable and it really should be soundly rejected. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, where, in, where it's possible to petition our own uh, statewide lawmakers, especially around the time of the Farm Bill, to continue to reject subsidizing corn and soy. Our food system is so tilted toward those products that when we are thinking, even as we're speaking about increasing uh, public health and increasing the consumption of uh, fruits, vegetables, and grains, those products are more expensive and less accessible because they are not subsidized in the same way. And I think for individuals, but also institutions, any institution that provides food service, there needs to be a real reckoning with uh, reducing meat consumption and especially of chickens and fish, which make up the bulk of factory farming. Um, even though uh, pigs and cows are more uh, alike uh, mammals in terms of our own kinship, in terms of the sheer number, I mean, you can imagine when someone goes out for wings, how many animals are just being eaten in that one time. This is why um, the chicken industry has really been skyrocketing uh, because people have, for various reasons, for particular things, uh, thoughts of health reasons, or perhaps uh, uh, ideas that uh, eating that would be more sustainable for some reason, but it's over 90% of uh, the factory farming comes through uh, fish and chickens. But I think importantly, we see massive explosion right now in an, another area of my research, which is in cell cultured and plant-based meat, milk, and eggs. Uh, this has been grow it's been existed for decades, but the last 15 years, we've seen a steady growth. And then in the last two, these products, uh, we can think Impossible, uh, Burgers, Beyond Meat, many uh, other uh, innovators, they have exploded. And when we have this hole in the food supply, those companies have uh, slipped in and been able to ramp up their own production. And in fact, uh, this is seen as such a threat to the meat producers that you have uh, seen that companies such as Tyson, Cargill, Smithfield, they all now have their plant-based meat lines. They are all trying to uh, begin to diversify because they see not only the direction of public sentiment, but that if you want to shore up a food supply that is not in danger of being susceptible to pandemics, you have to move away from uh, utilizing the, our living kin. And we are now in a time where uh, people who are used to eating meat can begin to uh, examine their own values, their own thoughts about the environment, their own ethics, and they can in fact uh, shift to alternatives that uh, will provide certain elements of the same, uh, and, and in some cases, almost an identical uh, aesthetic experience while making an enormous ecological and uh, an ethical impact for uh, humans, animals, and the environment.
and even meat producers are beginning to see the writing on the wall to the degree that institutions can uh, really get behind this kind of innovation and these kinds of alternatives you will see them be able to those producers be able to scale a secure food supply that can become increasingly affordable even uh, more accessible to all people around the globe so i think those are some uh, some basic steps uh, that are actually very much within reach of individuals and institutions to make major changes to uh, shift the current trends of meat production. Well, I want to thank you for sketching out that horizon of possible change for us and for your call to awareness and really for what's been a, a fascinating and enlightening conversation for myself and I, uh, I'm sure for our viewers of COVID-19, the humanities response. So I want to really thank you again and um, ask our, our viewers to uh, join us for our next episode of COVID-19, the humanities response. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tyrus. It's really been good to be with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.